Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Uh, so, uh, again, my name is Mel Sabella. I'm the program chair for this meeting. Uh, I want to welcome you back. Um, we have an awesome speaker coming up in just a few, in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but first, we wanted to uh, recognize uh, Greg Servin for his uh, support of the organization. He's the one that kind of set up the workshops. And we have a really nice plaque for him. And so, Greg, if you're there, you are, Greg. OK. Lot of work, and we really appreciate your efforts and working on the workshops for us. So, thank Thanks. you very much. And okay. yes. uh, okay, so uh, okay, uh, who's who's excited about climate change? Okay, <laughs> so uh, so. So, so one of the one of the really awesome things I get to do as program chair is is is, is invite awesome plenary speakers to our meeting, and I'm really excited to have uh, Lynn Talley here. Uh, so Lynn is a distinguished professor uh, at the University of California, San Diego, and also Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and her work uh, looks at large scale uh, water mass and the circulation of of the world ocean. And so, and how that kind of connects to, to climate change. So I'm, I'm really excited about this talk. Um, so, so Lynn has degrees from Oberlin College. Uh, she got her BA in physics there. And she also got a Bachelor of Music in uh, piano performance. So uh, next time, maybe we'll, we'll do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so af after that, she got her PhD in oceanography at uh, MIT and Woods Hole, and um, she has a number of awards. Uh, I'm just going to mention a few of them because it's a long list. Uh, so she's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, um, uh, Henry Strommel Research Award at the, from the American Meteorological Society. Um, yeah, she was also... Um, She's the author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, and has done a lot of really interesting work and a lot of work that really connects physics to, to oceans, to climate change. And we're really excited to have Lynn here today. And so let's give a round of applause for Lynn. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. It's going to be challenging. I'm going to be turning my back a little because there's no way to see what's going on here. Let's look over there. So, ready, get set, go. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. And um, title actually isn't anything about quantum physics, <laughs> it's, uh, um, unfortunately. Um, physics in the changing climate of the Southern Ocean and Antarctica. And uh, that's a little bit uh, grandiose. Um, we'll look at climate change and the Southern Ocean. Um, and let's see if I can figure this out. Here we go. Um, basically four separate modules to the talk. Um, a little bit of introduction about who we are. Um, uh, we owe it all to physics teachers and math teachers um, out there. And um, climate, then I'm gonna really hit climate change hard because as I was putting this talk together, I thought, you know, this is really timely. Let's just get the evidence that we all know about out there on the table and stress it. Um, and then I'm going to talk some ocean physics, uh, just show you what kind of, you know, at the, at the introductory graduate level, um, upper undergraduate level, what we do uh, with fluid mechanics. And then some, something about the Southern Ocean, which is really what, uh, what I'm focused on these days. And most of my funding right now comes from NSF um, and in kind kind of funding from NOAA. A uh, very large project called SOCOM. Uh, we have a lot of outreach on there if you're interested. An adopt a float program, I'll advertise up front, uh, for middle school. Um, science classes, um, and a whole lot of, a lot of interesting stuff. A Southern Ocean Carbon and Climate Observations and Modeling. Um, let's see, so forward. Uh, I want to start back in high school. Mr. Nalance, I don't have a picture of him, but there's a slinky in the hall, and I remember that experiment. So <laughs> thank you, whoever does slinky in the hall experiments. <laughs> And it was the only course that was so hard that my father had to help me. So <laughs> this is good. I guess that's why I became a physics major, back in Philadelphia. 
Um, and there's a 1974 physics department. Uh, Bob Hilborn is there. Oops, it's, uh oh, let's back it up. Well, there's me. Oh, oh well, that was a lot. That was a lot of years ago. Subtracting your heads. There's Bob. Um, my advisor back here, Bruce Richards, um, and Bob Weinstock, who taught us all um, advanced math. And a lot of uh, the cohort, there's Jim who sent the picture around. He's been at Caltech for many, many years. Um, physics, I went there because of the piano, actually. Um, and uh, because you could do anything you wanted, and who wanted to narrow themselves down in high school to figure out what you're going to do for the rest of your life. So liberal arts, yay. Uh, go for it, and then decide. And physics was great. Thank you, physics department. Um, so, do I go forward here? Uh, this is me just a couple years ago with another group. Uh, this is on a ship. I am a seagoing oceanographer. Um, this is in the South Pacific, uh, someplace, this is closer to Tahiti than to Antarctica, but in between. Um, and the whole big crew. Uh, we had about 12 graduate students on that cruise, um, we do a, and a bunch of postdocs, a lot of training going on. And we're making, basically, I would say, the best measurements in the a part of the big group that makes the best measurements in the world for accuracy, um, top to bottom uh, glo global measurements. Um, and these cruises temp typically take two to three months and they cross a little bit of the ocean. And we have one leaving um, pretty much two or three times a year. Um, and we have opportunities on those for um, graduate students mostly. Okay, forward. And just some pictures, uh, so put some faces on the newer generation, well, and also, well, the technicians and engineers are very important too. Uh, down here is in the left corner is a graduate student at UW, um, that's Earl. Uh, he's out south of uh, India someplace, uh, down Kerguelen. Um, putting a float in the water, this is our, our newest instrument that with a lot of, see if I figure out how to do this, sensors on the top. Um, there's a, a fleet of these now, but we're up to 100, we're growing to 200, that's the main NSF funding. There's another one going out in a box, his is not in a box. Um, dabbled around the Southern Ocean, starting to make um, the first ever measurements um, under ice and over winter of lots of parts of the cycle, uh, temperature, salinity, carbon, um, biology. Um, up at the top is the float lab at University of Washington, one of the main engineers up there between that set of floats. Um, so, and a few more student uh, pictures. Um, this is uh, on that cruise. Down, this, is, uh, this is our main instrument. We lower into the water and collect water in the bottles. Uh, and then there's, the elect there's digital uh, instruments on the bottom. We profile to the bottom, five meters from the bottom. I'm really obsessive about that. Um, and high quality measurements. So we're going down five, five to six kilometers of water. And up in the right is um, some of the students um, doing sampling, and down on the bottom is, is students uh, actually operating the console. So we have um, a lot of hands-on stuff. And this is uh, my postdoc. This is a picture she took, had, she had taken of her about two weeks ago. She's as close to Antarctica as you can get south of India um, on a, a South African research vessel with a, that's run by India, a, a scientific group. Uh, so she's deploying uh, another group of these floats down there, and they're doing a lot of research. Um, so she's, this is her third huge cruise. So we're training up the next generation. And um, I understand the textbooks are now obsolete from Bob at lunch, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I did author a textbook. <laughs> so it's out there <laughs> and working on the next edition. Uh, but it should all go online and interactive and distributed authorship after that. <laughs> right, <laughs> okay. Um, and um, this is a part we're going to launch into now on climate change. Um, I've been a part of a lot of different consensus type activities. We think of science as scientific method, and then there's scientific consensus. These are different things. One you do by yourself, consensus you do in groups. Um, and the National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. is the, is the premier place to do that, um, where you get together as a committee and you decide what the consensus is on the science. Um, and with uncertainties always with uncertainty estimates if it's, a, if it's actual science. So what do you believe? It's believe is the wrong word. What do you know and how well do you know it? Um, so as part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, I was one of many lead authors. There are 259 in the last go round, so I was one of those. Um, and um, we wrote 14 chapters and uh, we had 54,677 review comments and you had to answer every single one of them. This is a well-vetted document. How many, who's heard of this thing? the IPCC. Oh, thank you. Okay, so this is the international consensus on where climate change is. This was the physical understanding of it, uh, uh, volume. And there were two other volumes, one on biology and one on, on adaptation. 
and mitigation. Um, so there we all are in at one of our meetings. That was in Marrakesh. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna start, I, I think most of the talk will highlight results from there and then we'll get to the Southern Ocean of Physics. Um, so I just wanna make sure you hear these messages long, strong and clear that all of these people agree with uncertainty estimates. When it says unequivocal, that doesn't sound scientific, but that is the, that is the, that is the number. Unequivocal, warming is unequivocal, human influence is clear, continued greenhouse gas emissions will cause further warming, and limiting climate change requires substantial sustained reductions of emissions. That is the bottom line out of um, three books that stack up this high in fine font, small font, that's the bottom line. All backed up. Um, in the ocean, we, have, we had some ocean chapters. Um, we have some um, strong findings there as well. Uh, and these are not couched with the uncertainty estimates, but in the text you find them all. Um, ocean warming is where most of the energy is going in the climate system. The ocean is serving a huge service to the climate. Um, we'll say 93% of the excess energy is in the ocean, and it's warming the ocean. Um, that warming does what? Oh, it expands the water. So it's leading to par part of the reason we have um, uh, sea level rise. Um, second, the ocean is performing another service by absorbing about 30% of that excess carbon dioxide. Um, so that's great. One third stays in the atmosphere, one third in the land, in the plants, one third into the ocean. Great. Oh, yeah. Well, it causes acidification when it does that. So it gets dissolved into the water. And that's a significant environmental uh, stress. Uh, third, uh, we have human influences detectable. There are attribution, ways to do att att formal attribution. Uh, the warming of the atmosphere and the ocean, changes in global water cycle um, um, are attributed to human influence. There is natural climate change, climate variability. We all study that as well. It's very, very important. Uh, and what we're doing here is extracting a trend that's attributable to human influence. And finally, the heat is penetrating from the surface to the deep ocean. Um, it is starting to affect the ocean circulation. We couldn't say that very unequivocally about five years ago, but now we can. Okay, so is the, ocean, is the earth warming? Yeah, okay, <laughs> there's a change since 1901. Uh, big areas of white, because it wasn't all measured in 1901. Um, but uh, any map that you look at will show you that it's warming. Um, and on the right are some graphs uh, showing the um, global um, mean surface temperature. The bottom shows the decadal averages, and the last three decades all climb up. There were sort of bumps and wiggles and a lot of screaming about the hiatus, but when you average it, it's going up. And as you all know, the answer right now this year is it went on up. Um, and there it is. There's a, today, I think I pulled this off this morning, uh, global temperature, there we are, boop, boop, there uh, today. Um, so there was a little plateau, but look what, look what we recovered. <laughs> um, and this is the trend up to 2016, uh, so mostly warming. There are places that cool. Southern Ocean is pretty interesting. Uh, so this is interesting in the dynamics. There's a nice uh, cooling spot in the middle of the North Atlantic that's the subject of, of uh, huge workshops now, too, because uh, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, mostly it's warming, and mostly it's warming in the North, not the South. They're different. The northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere are different. Why are they different? Uh, oh, there's no land between South America and Antarctica. Uh, the ocean is, free, is open all the way around, and that changes the dynamics completely in the southern hemisphere. So we have um, no way for the warm water to cross south. Um, and so you have only filling in from below. It's upwelling. We'll get to that maybe. Um, and this is the projection for 90 years from now, uh, depending on whether, whether you think uh, we'll do a good job of keeping greenhouse gases down or not. Um, on the right is the one where we don't. Um, and so warming stays uh, polar amplified to the north. The Antarctic area also warms, but not the ocean. Um, so Antarctic warming and Greenland warming are a problem because of ice sheets. Um, and that is a problem. Okay, um, why is it warming? Oh, well, mostly it's due to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and there's very careful accounting for all of them. This is the canonical um, CO2 curve at Mauna Loa, uh, started in the 1950s during the I IGY, so that's a little nice history of science thing. A lot of carbon and ocean research starting uh, back then. Um, and it continues to go up. There's a nice seasonal cycle. The, the planet breathes in the summer and winter. 
Uh, there are some bumps and wiggles in there that are El Ninos. Mostly this is, hum is human. And we can map out where the carbon's going in the ocean, the excess carbon, mostly in the North Atlantic, but there's a nice big band of it that, that integrates to quite a lot around Antarctica. Okay, well, that taking one third of the CO2 out does cause ocean acidification. Um, there's a pteropod. They've been studying these. This is the base of the food chain in a lot of places, and they are, are affected by acidification. Southern Ocean and the northern North Pacific are areas that are acidifying fastest. Um, onward. Okay, and just two slides on how we're observing. Um, this, um, these are the floats, the, some of the floats we're using. This is the big array of the global array. This is our observing network for the ocean now that goes on. Every 10 days, there's a profile by one of these at these dots. We have 3,700 floats globally. That is our weather network for the ocean. It's turned into a way to completely transforming our way to sea, um, away from ships. We need ships for um, ground truth. Um, so this is our upper ocean changes. It's a very different pattern from the uh, surface temperature change. This is heat change in the upper ocean. And we see um, a lot of heating also in the Atlantic and the, and the North Pacific off the Kershio, a band here coming along a current. Mainly it's red everywhere. And then these sort of highlighted spots. The deep ocean looks very different. And so the kind of cruises we were doing here were measuring to the bottom. And from those, we construct maps of the deep, deep uh, temperature changes. Here you see a really different pattern. It's Southern Ocean centric. That's why we're interested in the Southern Ocean, for one thing. And a fair amount of heat is going into the Southern Ocean um, percent. Uh, we'll come to that. Um, anyway, the deep ocean is also warming. We're, we're affecting the whole uh, globe in places where um, this part of the ocean is pretty much exposed to the atmosphere. Water comes up, water goes down, there's a cycle. Um, and if you're going to see warming, we now, now say, oh yeah, we knew that. We didn't know it until we saw this wonderful picture from Perky and Johnson. But now we get it, um, why this region is warming faster than anywhere else. The North Pacific is 500 years old, and you're not going to see it there except by a little bit of shove of water around. Uh, here you're seeing a direct change. Um, okay, so here's a graph showing uh, the energy in different parts of the um, Earth system from uh, 1970 up to the, almost, well, it's up to 2012 for the IPCC. Um, there's the top, this is the main curve. Energy's going up. There are ups and downs. These are El Ninos and decadal oscillations, but there's a relentless increase. That trend is the global warming trend. That's anthropogenic. Um, this big blue, light blue wedge is the upper ocean. This dark blue wedge is the deep ocean. And the atmosphere, the part we live in, is this teeny little thing down here. Uh, global warming, it, it does affect the temperature more here, but the heat is mostly water. Water has a higher heat capacity than air. So we get most of the energy into the ocean. So I could skip those two. Um, we're also having impacts on ice. This is the Arctic sea ice. You've all heard about this, I'm sure. Uh, this is attributable to warming because the warming is polar amplified at the surface. Not at the deep, but at the surface where the ice is, it's polar amplified. So this is a time series you can pull off of the NSIDC website anytime you want. Um, and uh, there's the time series over, uh, I, can't, I can't read that, and you can't either. A lot of decades <laughs> decreasing. Um, and then they show you nice maps showing, I can't even see the magenta line here either. They show you the, um, the, the, uh, the historical sort of average and then the actual, you know, that's the actual sea ice concentration that day or month. Um, and it is definitely decreasing. And of course we all worry about that. Well, except if you have some money invested in the polar regions, and that's great, invest, go ahead. Um, Antarctic is also changing. This is brand new. Up until two years ago, we had lots of workshops on why the Antarctic sea ice is expanding. Well, now it's not. <laughs> so now it's going down. Um, so this is the sea ice right now, December 2017. Um, and uh, the, uh, the climatological edge is way out here. This is melted way back. This is the Atlantic sector south of, and south of um, Africa. Um, Big, big change over here, and everybody's on this, you know, thinking about why it's happened this year, including us, because we have a lot of floats that we've put in that area. So you can see the summer sea ice um, had a lot of noise, not much of a trend, and then it's had quite a change here. 
So there's a lot of interest. This is ground, this is um, for cutting edge research. Why is it? What sets the Antarctic sea ice? Um, and the other part of this climate story is the um, ice sheets. Um, this is the um, Antarctic ice sheet. Um, this is the continental ice, and this is the Greenland one. These are the two big ones. Red is where it's losing mass, where it's warm. This is, well, this is actually temperature. It's not losing, I'll show another one losing mass. This is the losing, um, losing mass down here. Um, lots and lots of um, interest in Greenland is easy to reach. It's kind of cold there, but you can work there. And Antarctica, um, a lot more um, expeditions and research going on, especially in the West Antarctic ice sheet area, that's the most um, vulnerable. And this is where the big chunks of ice shelves are coming off. Okay, here's another one showing, I'm gonna relate this to the ocean now. This is not IPCC. Um, this is a change in ice sheet mass. There's Antarctica, so I'm gonna go down to the Southern Ocean. Where it's red is where it's accelerating and losing um, mass in the ice sheet and they can do that with satellite measurements. Um, we are linking that to the ocean. It also links to the atmosphere. The atmosphere is bringing in warm wind here. There's a huge um, permanent low system here, the Amundsen Sea Low that brings in um, higher, uh, lower latitude air. The ocean is also doing its job. This is deep water spiraling up and into the surface um, next to that area. So it's gonna melt from below. So changes in this circulation, uh, bringing in this deep warm water from the Atlantic um, up to where it naturally, normally is in contact with the ice shelves. If you increase that, then that's gonna also be a factor in melting ice shelves. That's what we're interested in in Southern Ocean Oceanography, one of the things. Another, and then one of the last pictures here for, um, uh, no, it's not the last, but the second to last on um, climate change is sea level rise. Um, it's 15 centimeters is just that. It's my hand, okay, who cares? Um, <laughs> but it's relentless, it's standing in your living room and the water's starting to come in under the door and it's not going back. <laughs> it's just gonna go up. Um, and so the sea level, but it's, it, there's also, that's on average over the whole globe because the ocean is warming, so that rises, and the land ice, land fast ice is melting, so it's adding water to the system at a very slow rate, but there it is. Uh, those are sort of equivalent in, uh, in uh, not totally, but sort of equivalent. Um, but when you look at a map, um, you know, of the global sea level rise over a bunch of decades, it actually looks, you know, much more spatially interesting. And that's, uh, of course, what you want to get into as a scientist. You know, why does it have um, these particular trends? Why is it going up in some places way up over here? Oh, yeah, Pacific Islands. Uh, well, maybe it's not affecting us too much over here in California, um, but it is going up since 1920. It's gone up the 15 centimeters at the La Jolla tide gauge, I can tell you that. So um, on top of, this is a natural climate change signal superimposed on top of um, the relentless slow sea, route, sea level rise. And there's a projection, see it's sort of there, a projection up to the end of the century um, of a, a meter by 2100, that is a conservative estimate. The most important thing I want to tell people about IPCC is that it is a conservative estimate in every case because there is so much, because it's a consensus um, and you have reviewers and you can't just splat something in there. Uh, you have to back it up. Um, and so um, I've been part of discussions and arguments about whether to include things or not. They didn't include the ice sheets in the AR4, the one before this, because they didn't have the um, consensus on it. Now they do. Okay, precipitation patterns are changing as well. Um, I won't get into that too much. Here we go. Um, that's documented on land, but most of the world is covered by ocean. What do you do? You don't know whether the rain more or less. How can you measure rain back in 1920 over the middle of the ocean? Well, we have salinity, <laughs> so we can do it. Um, so um, people have been making measurements of salinity, maybe not since 1920, but a lot since the 30s and 40s, and certainly the 50s. Um, and so this is a, a map at the bottom of the global surface salinity. I'm tr still trying to work on this thing. Um, it's high in places where it's orange and red, it's high. Uh, where it's low, it's blue. Um, it's kind of an interesting pattern. Um, so you see uh, very salty where you're in the um, subtropical highs where it's dry air, not raining very much. Rainy areas, lots of runoff areas, it's blue, that means it's, it's pretty fresh. Um, 
And the evaporation precipitation pattern that leads to that we understand pretty well. Um, so what happens in a warming world is that um, the atmosphere is warmer. It is warmer. Um, that allows more water vapor. That's Clausius Clapeyron. Um, uh, atmospheric scientists will say, oh, well, that's mitigated by all the nonlinear effects, and you know, there's lots of, but actually, the increase in water vapor is not too far off from Clausius Clapeyron. Um, and if you have more water vapor in the atmosphere, that means you're evaporating more and precipitating more. You're cranking more through. And so what we see in the ocean, um, this third panel down, is the trend in surface salinity. This is the surface salinity map at the bottom. This is the trend. And it's noisy because our data sets aren't so great, but it is a trend and it kind of matches up pretty well. And there is a correlation uh, with the global salinity pattern. That's suggesting that salty is getting saltier, fresh is getting fresher. Areas that are net evaporation are getting drier. Areas that are net precipitation are getting wetter. And that's the predict prediction for land as well. Uh, rich get richer, poor get poorer in terms of water. Or all get yeah, different, all, all, all become more exaggerated with regional shifts and lots of details and caveats and high-resolution high models and everything, but on average, looking at the big picture, that's what you see. Okay, so that's pretty much the summary of the climate that I was going to give. Uh, that's, that's that set of results. And I guess what I want to say from that is that this is all backed up by lots and lots of peer review literature, lots of measurements, um, and there's no... Um, there's no belief system here. This is measurements, observations. Um, and the projections ahead are models. Uh, what we do with the observations is to um, work with the models and improve the models. Climate models are not perfect. Um, so there's lots of questions around that. But if the models are reproducing what we observe and observe without a model, um, then we're pretty confident in what we're, what we're looking at. So that you have that, you have the evidence. The belief system comes in how you deal with the evidence. How do you deal um, with, you know, do you think you should adapt, mitigate, leave it alone, or should you really cut down on emissions? What do you want to do? That's your job to decide for yourself. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the physics that we do uh, when we start graduate school in physical oceanography. I'm a physical oceanographer. I didn't know what that was until I applied to graduate school. <laughs> I didn't start out in high school wanting to be an oceanographer. I didn't even end college wanting to be one. <laughs> I decided to be one. Why? Because Woods Hole Oceanographic had sent a magazine uh, to the um, Oberlin Physics Lounge. <laughs> and one of my classmates, Howie Brayman, who was brilliant, Bob remembers Howie, wow. Um, Howie applied for their summer program and didn't get in. I thought, oh my god. <laughs> Uh, but Fran got in. Fran Hotchkiss went as a geophysics student. Um, so there it was. And then I was off doing sort of a master's degree in piano performance in Europe, thinking, oh, what do you want to do with your life? Do you really want to sit in a dark... Oops, sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> apologies to those of you who do this. <laughs> sit in a dark lab for the rest of your life, you know, finding ground loops in the electronics. <laughs> and uh, I decided I would just as soon sit in front of the inevitable computer but with the ocean view. <laughs> and a chance to travel, and something you could actually touch, not the star. And you know, astrophysics was great, but you can't go there. Um, you can go down to the ocean, you can walk on it, people write poetry about it. That's basically what it came down to, but I only applied to one program, and I didn't think I'd get in. Well, because <laughs> I had shown no previous interest in oceanography or fluid mechanics, <laughs> and uh, there we were. Well, I was the exact student they were looking for. They were looking for um, an undergraduate physics major. Um, who had had all the courses through quantum mechanics and taken the, you know, taken the GRE and everything else that you need to go on in any field of physics. Uh, so it's really important to let the sky be the limit on options for your students. Um, so here we go. Uh, who's that on the left? That's Isaac Newton. We don't do quantum mechanics in the ocean. <laughs> we do Newtonian mechanics. <laughs> so I was kind of happy about that. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> well, my senior thesis was, was down in there at the quantum level. It was, um, it was super conductivity. Um, anyway, um, and on the right, you may not recognize his picture because I don't necessarily. That's Coriolis. Uh, we're on a rotating, this is a rotating fluid. And I didn't put in all the pictures of everybody that did fluid mechanics. Very important um, set of scientists, especially in the 19th century. 
Um, um, and uh, what, how we do this, how we approach what we're doing as physical oceanographers is through the three legs, observations, theory, and modeling. Um, observations is what I do now. That's our current observing system. Um, you can pull that off the internet uh, from something called JCOM Ops. Um, theory is what we learn in graduate school and which some people continue to practice and it gives you all of your insight you need for looking at the models and the observations. It's absolutely critical. Um, and then computer modeling is getting more and more and more um, um, important. Uh, it's really essential to um, everything we do now. Um, and this is the way I would introduce this, I do introduce this every fall to our students. Um, our governing equations, I write them in words because half the class is biologists, and, and you write a partial derivative and they go, holy, oh, I'm in graduate school now. <laughs> and then they work really hard and get the A pluses. <laughs> um, so I do it in words. Um, we have seven equations, that's it for what we do in oceanography. We have the three momentum equations, F equals MA, and we reverse it to MA equals F, because that's a fluid. Um, and then we divide by uh, volume, so we express it in density. And so that's it. That those are our three momentum equations. Um, we, have, um, we include Coriolis force if we're at large enough scale, in time scale and spatial scale. Time scale has to be more than a day to feel the Earth, and probably more than a couple of kilometers. Um, we have continuity, which I call the no-holes no rule um, for a fluid. Um, and we have then our equations of state. So we have an equation of state for seawater, which is highly nonlinear and empirical. It's not like the ideal gas law at all. So you measure it. Um, and um, people measure it. I don't measure it. Um, Frank Malero is the latest person that's been doing that for years. And then we evolve temperature and salinity, which are the temperature and salinity pressure feed into the equation of state. That's it. Okay, um, and our Earth is rotating, so we have a Coriolis effect. Well, then we write down these equations, and then the biologists really just decide to leave. <laughs> our physics students are all go, yeah, I got it. Thanks to you guys. <laughs> um, so we step through all of this the first quarter. Um, the physics students and atmospheric science students are, are all learning this in their fluid mechanics class, and they usually haven't had that before they get there. Uh, so they learn to take the momentum equations and uh, turn them into um, this full set of terms, uh, an acceleration and three advection terms, um, and then there's a pressure gradient force, and then there's uh, viscous terms, three of them in three different directions. And Coriolis, that's all that's there. And in the vertical direction, we add gravity. That's it. Boom. Um, from that, you get, uh, because of these nonlinear terms, and because of something I'll show you in the next few slides, that this applies to bubbles up to general circulation, um, these equations are pretty complicated. Our equation of state is, as I said, nonlinear in temperature, salinity, and pressure, and then we have temperature and salinity evolution equations, which depend on um, the heat source and, and a fresh water source, basically. It's precipitation evaporation. Um, these viscous terms up here are the ones that are important. They get the wind into the ocean. And so we spend a lot of time figuring out how to parameterize that. Um, here's what makes these equations complicated. We go from capillary waves to breakers and waves. We move up to, this is the Gulf Stream. This is a false color image of one, of one day. This is an actual image of the surface set temperature in the western North Atlantic. Uh, there comes the Gulf Stream up here. It's highly unstable. It is a fluid, um, so it's not just going to shoot out there in a laminar fashion. Lots of smaller scale eddies, um, but you can see on the large scale back here, cold to the north, warm to the south, um, and there's a circulation going on. Uh, so those equations have to apply there. They have to apply, this is a surface circulation. This is a wonderful product called OSCAR. Oh, I forgot to put it on there, O-S-C-A-R. Um, you can go online and find it. Uh, it's a NASA visual visualization. Uh, this is data-based, and that's why I like it. Um, it's got minimal model uh, between the data and um, us. <laughs> it, so it's, it's using a lot of satellite information. You can see the, you know, the strong currents and the complexity and the um, eddies, eddying in the strong currents um, on there. Um, I'm going to try to make that stop. And then uh, we go to something that's not such a fancy animation, the global overturning circulation. You're used to seeing this, if you've seen it at all, as the conveyor belt, which shows water sinking in the North Atlantic and rising in the Indian and Pacific. Well, it ain't so simple. 
Um, the, these, I, this is what I consider to be the, the most basic components of the general cir overturning circulation of the globe. Uh, water going uh, north into the Atlantic, sinking, coming down here as green, uh, deep water, and entering the Southern Ocean. Um, we have Southern Ocean water entering the highest latitudes here and turning into blue water, sinking and going back. And you notice one feature of this thing is this um, highway around Antarctica. This is the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. It connects the whole globe. It connects all of the three oceans together. Water moves in and out of each ocean through the, through the Antarctic Circumpolar Current and a little bit of diversion through the Indonesian passages in South of Africa. But this is our big uh, connector for the world ocean. That's another reason the Southern Ocean is very interesting. Um, and then we go all the way up to climate. I found this on some, some images of climate systems last night. <laughs> I thought it was kind of pretty because it's 3D. Um, it's showing that there's ocean and there's land and there's the atmosphere. To do climate modeling, um, which is another um, wonderful discipline to get into as a physics major, um, you um, need to couple all those together. And you can imagine the range of space, space and time scales that go into that. And there you're into very large computer modeling. This is a way to display what we're looking at, complexity here with the time scales and the spatial scales from millimeters to the global scale, 10,000 kilometers, uh, from 0 0.01 seconds of bubbles up to thousands of years of the Milankovitch cycles of the orbit changes of the Earth. So we're trying to explain all of these phenomena with seven equations. Oh, okay, that's hard. Um, no computer model can do that. Uh, nobody in their head and their pencil on paper can do that. Uh, so what do we do? Um, uh, we basically, how many people do fluid mechanics out there of some sort? You're all so familiar with this. Jason's an oceanographer. Um, what you do to deal with that is a scale analysis. This is what you learn in your, in your uh, graduate classes um, of, taking, of, of looking at all the terms and deciding how big they might be and whatever you're looking at and then figuring out how, what they balance with. Uh, and that gives you a dominant balance and it tells you sort of some, a really basic fundamental physics that's going on. Um, and then you say, oh, the rest of it, maybe it's all kind of small, maybe it's not. But mostly, you know, your hope, it is small. You can show by scaling that it is small. Uh, I'll show you one of the dominant balances. This is the, my word equations that I put up there to, so that the biologists don't leave. <laughs> um, geostrophic flow is, at the large scale, our, our most important balance. It's a balance between the Coriolis term and the pressure gradient force. So the pressure gradient force is driven by, um, at the surface, by having higher water and lower water that's basically permanently there. So the Gulf Stream is high towards Bermuda and low towards Florida, and that is a permanent structure, and that drives a northward flow, um, turning to the right of the pressure gradient force. Uh, so this is our basic, basics for geostroph for large-scale flow. If you're doing waves, that is not your balance at all. You don't care. Um, if you're doing, um, you know, surface waves or even mostly internal waves. Um, another important balance for what I'm going to show here is called Ekman balance. How many people have heard of that? No, maybe two. Okay. Um, this is where we balance Coriolis. This is a guy named Walfried Ekman, around 1905 or 3, sometime back then, who observed icebergs in Norway, Norwegian fjords, and the wind blowing, and the icebergs went to the right of the wind, and he went, oh, <laughs> okay, Coriolis must be pushing those. So he wrote down this simple balance, uh, and it's a very, very important one. This is how the wind gets into the ocean. Um, so um, the balance is between Coriolis and the vertical viscous term, not the horizontal ones, but the vertical one. So you have these sheared, shearing friction going on, a frictional a uh, frictional boundary layer, and the wind is pushing the surface of the ocean. It's actually push making waves, and the waves are making turbulence, and all this is going on, and a lot of people studied those scales. For a large-scale oceanographer, that all boils into sort of a frictional, turbulent layer uh, that's sheared, driven by the wind. And it squirts to the right of the wind in the northern hemisphere, and importantly, in the southern hemisphere, which way would it go? To the left. Coriolis in the southern hemisphere is to the left. Um, so those are the two big ones. Uh, these are the external forces on the ocean. I don't have a clock up here. Is there a, any way to tell? Ten minutes till questions. Ten minutes till questions. Good. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. 
External forces are the winds, um, and heating and cooling, evaporation, precipitation, and tidal forces and gravity. But let's look at the winds as the main thing that drive that big circulation. Um, these are the westerly winds in the southern hemisphere. Um, the color shows how strong they are. Red means they're going towards the east. Um, blue is, is easterly winds going towards the west. Those are our trade winds. Um, you can see the westerlies are strongest in the southern hemisphere. You may think if you just came in from the east coast that they're strongest in the northern hemisphere, but <laughs> they blow up into cyclones, yay, up there. Um, uh, and they do the same down here. Oh, let's look at this image of yesterday in earth.nullschool.net, my favorite app. <laughs> this is actually in, in motion if you do it on your phone um, or your computer, just, just to sit around in the evening and go, oh man, look at that, look at that hurricane. Ooh, there's one in the Indian Ocean today. Um, <laughs> I saw it, there it is, whew. Uh, but you can see the cyclones going on up there. This is all beautiful. You see big, these are cyclonic also in the Southern Hemisphere, they're going the other direction. Cyclones in the Northern Hemisphere go that way. Cyclones in the Southern Hemisphere go that way. So what goes into that mean wind pattern is this mess every hour. Uh, but you average it out and you get an average band, band or westerly. So we're looking at the average circulation. This is what the Ekman looks like. The wind blows on the ocean. Um, up here, wind is blowing. Uh, the surface current is to the right and then it spirals downward each layer, uh, pushing the next layer down to the right. And the net uh, integrated transport in that layer, which is only 50 meters thick, only 50 meters out of 5,000 of the ocean, um, is to the right. That's what's driving the ocean circulation mostly. Um, this is also from the course. Um, if we look at this as a westerly wind coming this way, and then um, this is the strongest westerlies. This is a northern hemisphere example. Um, and then to the north of it, it's weaker and weaker. And to the south of it, it's weaker and weaker. And, and then you've got an Ekman transport off to the right of that. You'll have most Ekman transport in the middle, less and less. Where'd the Ekman transport go? It went down. So that's Ekman convergence. That drives the general circulation. So you're going to squash the water down. Uh, and then you're going to have an angular momentum principle. So this is what the world, um, this is wind stress curl um, that drives this um, upwelling and downwelling. Um, this is a, a satellite-based map. Uh, we can measure winds that well and calculate that here in the, um, let's look up in the northern hemisphere. Um, where we are in San Diego is a downwelling region. There's not much living out there. The water's coming from the surface, stripped of nutrients going down. Life doesn't, you know, bleh, not much. You need upwelling to bring up nutrients. We got lots of nutrients in the north. That's where the uh, water's coming up, bringing up nice, nice dirt from the ocean uh, and supporting a very vigorous ecosystem. Um, in the Southern Hemisphere, we have a big, the colors reverse because the curl is this, you know, the curl is the curl, but you have to take F into account, the Coriolis parameter. Uh, this, all this red becomes the downwelling subtropics, and there's all our upwelling around Antarctica, and this is very, very critical for the circulation around Antarctica. Um, one way can, we can see that, there, that this is actually operating is to look at uh, nutrients. This is nitrate. It's comes up from below the surface layer. There's a very productive surface layer that strips it all out. All the biology uses it up. Um, it all regenerates below. And then if it upwells, look at all that upwelled nutrients around Antarctica. There's an ecosystem. Um, and there's the North Pacific ecosystem. So upwelling is really, really important. And you can see it in ocean co surface color. Um, this is showing the chlorophyll. Uh, so there's the big deserts of the subtropics where the water's going down. Um, and here's the big productive regions of the higher latitudes and the tropics. The equator is an upwelling zone as well. Um, we need to know a little bit about temperature and salinity for what I'm doing next. I already showed salinity patterns. Temperature is what you might expect. It's warm at the equator, cold at the poles. That's all you need to know from there. Okay. <laughs> There's more sunlight at the equator <laughs> over the year. Warm water. We go there, for the, we go, we go there in the winter. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, if, if, what happens with this whole system? I'm looking now at the Southern Ocean, so we're, we're moving over to the Southern Ocean a bit. This is like Antarctica on the left side, um, subtropics to the right, um, and here comes the wind. Those are the westerly winds, and there's a big current. That's the Antarctic Circumpolar Current going around Antarctica, top to bottom, um, and upwelling, pulling water up to the surface, and it's actually pulling the deep water up to the surface. And it's pulling it up because of this surface layer. It's called the Ekman layer, Ekman transport, to the left of the wind, pushing off. 
Um, and so it's going to come up, bring its nutrients, bring high regenerated carbon, that's important for the carbon budget, bring relatively warm water. The surface water is freezing. Oh, yeah, the sea ice. Um, uh, why doesn't that sink? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, it, the ice rejects the salt. So the ice is a lot fresher than the seawater. If you want to see a really cool video animation, call, look up Brinicle, B-R-I-N-I-C-L-E, and watch the salt coming out of the icicles under the ice, forming sea ice. It's amazing. The, uh, the BBC icy finger of death <laughs> as, it, as it rolls over the starfish. Um, Anyway, you, what happens is when you make sea ice is it, rejects, is it rejects salt, and so it sits at the top. That's why it works on your, on your driveway and on your roads. Um, when you put salt out there, it melts the water. So it actually changes the, the freezing point, and then in this case, it, come, it sort of burns its way out of the ice and comes out. So the sea ice is very fresh, so it's a fractionation process. You've, you've now moved, moved um, a lot of the salt down, and then when the sea ice melts next spring, you're left with a nice fresh layer at the top. Um, so we have very, very cold water sitting on top of upwelling warm water. That warm water is coming up under the sea ice and under the ice shelves, and it's going to melt the, um, both of those. Um, it happens to some extent in the Arctic, but not nearly as much as the, the Southern Ocean. It's a really important mechanism. Um, and here you can see also, this is a, actually direct measurements of the upwelling effects. Um, this is a, a, a cut down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I, I was on at least three parts of that. Um, this is temperature, top to bottom of the ocean, uh, from Antarctica to um, Iceland, obviously this five kilometers does not match that 10,000, <laughs> so it's very exaggerated. Um, but what you see is uh, warm water at the surface in the low latitudes, cold water below, um, and then you see these isotherms um, up at the surface here. Um, you don't know that without people telling you, but that's a, that is a signal, first of all, of a current coming at you out of the page, and um, it's a result of upwelling. Um, and then this one I might skip by, but this is it's fun for physics. Angular momentum is how you get the circulation to go. Okay, the Ekman transport happened. Uh, now we're going to push that water down or pull it out. And when we push it down, we think in physics terms, not water. When you try to think about it as water, you get confused. But if you think of it as a column of water that you can, that's spinning because it's on the earth, and you can squash it or stretch it, by angular momentum of conservation, if you squash it and it's already spinning due to being on the Earth, it has to change its local spin rate, or it actually can change its latitude to a different um, apparent spin rate due to the Earth. Um, and that latter one is when we spend at least a full lecture or two on in class explaining that sort of totally counterintuitive idea that if you stretch or squash a column of water, it moves north or south. Um, that drives the general circulation. Um, and there's some nice graphics in different places. Um, National Geographic has done a nice thing on that at one point. Um, and that drives what we call the general circulation. These are the gyres of the ocean. That's the Gulf Stream and the Curcio and all the circulation around. Uh, what that squashing and stretching is driving is the circulation that's not in the Gulf Stream. It's driving all the circulation elsewhere, and then it all returns as a boundary current in the Gulf Stream. So this is boundary layer fluid mechanics. And we had this cool float. I just like this float, so I <laughs> put it up here. I don't know if this is really in spirit of balance, because you know, one, you know, one specific guy is not necessarily going to be the average. But it, this is kind of nice. It was very long-lived. It went on for um, seven years. It got uh, dumped in the water off of New Zealand, and then it sort of slowly drifted south, and it's heading towards Antarctica. It got itself into the Antarctic circumpolar current after it crossed the East Pacific rise, and it's moving on south. Um, the whole ACC does that, and so I think sort of balance is important. Okay, there's Southern Ocean Dynamics. We'll move a little bit here. There's a model of the um, Antarctic Circumpolar Current. This is a surface current in the Southern Ocean. This is a true model. It's a high-resolution um, NOAA Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory model um, showing um, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current not as a schematic, but as, um, as its full eddying self. Um, it start, if you start here off of South America um, with this big, um, this is the Malvinas current coming north, 
Uh, it comes on south, it gets joined by one off of um, Africa, and then heads on farther south, you can't tell where the center is, but it heads south, leaps a little bit up around New Zealand, and then keeps on coming back south. You know it's farther south, because it ends up here having to rejoin. So there's a spiral in. So when we look at the Southern Ocean this way, in this sort of this, this very simplified overturning circulation way, which is very useful in a lot of theory, um, we're missing some, some three-dimensional aspects to the circulation. And so we can go to three-dimensional aspects. Here's um, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and the Indian Ocean, all connecting into the Antarctic Circumpolar Current going around from observations, and models mostly show it too. Uh, we can figure out how the water comes in and out, and I won't go into the details, it isn't time, but we've got this picture of water um, exchanging in and out of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. No, da, da, da. skip, skip, skip. Okay, and this is a project I'm working on, so I just show it. Um, uh, there's been a whole, you know, the, the, the sort of the last 15 years of Southern Ocean theory has been zonally averaged, meaning they average all the way around Antarctica like you would do with winds, um, and think about balances that way. When you sort of stretch it out, you see that there are places where it's moving north and south, and so I think the dynamics that apply in these areas are quite different. Uh, that's fair to balance moving water south, where it's um, over a very uninteresting bottom, and then topography catching the circulation and moving it. Topography is really important in the Southern Ocean where there's very little stratification. So the whole ocean is feeling the bottom. And the sea ice is responding to that. Um, okay, and this is the picture of the water coming around. We had this already, the warm water coming around into Antarctica. Um, it's actually spiraling up. So the upwelling cell is bringing deep water up as we reach the West Antarctic Peninsula, and that's where we're getting some warming here um, and ice mass loss. So we did some modeling of this, um, and I'll just try to show a three, here's a three-dimensional model of particle release. Uh, this is a model that also is constrained by data sets. It's called a state estimate. Um, in the atmosphere, it would be called a reanalysis. Weather analysis is all done this way. Big models, lots of data plugged in, and ways of constraining that big model with the data. Uh, we're doing that with the ocean as well. Um, this is a model constrained by data, and then we release particles in the model and follow them. So we wanted to see how this worked. Oh, we do see this um, water coming in, in, this case, deep water from the Atlantic, spiraling around Antarctica and getting shallower. Um, as it reaches the West Antarctic Peninsula. So we're looking at, this is something we're doing now. Uh, this is my student, Veronica Tamsit, um, and she led this study. It was uh, recently published. Um, many people involved. And what she also found in this study with all of the co-authors is, um, is that all those instabilities of the current matter, and in fact the upwelling isn't uniform, it happens where the current is very eddying, over topography. The current comes along, whams into topography, gets squished up along the sides of things, it tries to get over, and goes unstable, as you might expect. Um, and the instabilities, that's what we call the eddy field, um, really um, uh, enhance the upwelling uh, locally. So that's something we're working on. I, I can't get, uh, you know, how to, how to put these large scale frameworks together with the eddy scale frameworks. And finally, a few slides on climate. What do I have, two minutes, one minute? We have about five minutes for questions. Five minutes for questions, okay. I'm gonna finish them very quickly. Um, just to, to sum up on what the Southern Ocean does for climate, and I haven't said these things before, so I wanna say them. Uh, that 93% of the heat that's in the ocean, the extra heat that's in the system, um, a large percent, two thirds of that is in the Southern Ocean, even though it didn't actually warm at the surface, but it's warm top to bottom. So a lot of the excess heat is going in the Southern Ocean. Um, anthropogenic carbon, I said that one third of the, of the excess anthropogenic carbon goes into the ocean. Of that excess, a half of it is going into the Southern Ocean. So again, that's an important place to study. And um, that upwelling brings all the nutrients up from below. That deep water is old and dirty. It's full of regenerated nutrients comes to the surface, you want to know the upwelling, upwelling uh, situation because you want to understand this, and those nutrients fertilize three quarters of the global ocean. 
The only place they don't fertilize is the northern North Pacific, is the North Pacific. They fertilize the rest of the world ocean. So everything's connected. Um, one of the things we're doing is looking at metrics um, uh, of the southern ocean circulation and ice and everything, and looking at those in climate models to see how well you know, the 15 or 20 climate models do on each of these metrics. That's how you improve the models. And here's what we're seeing um, actually from observations, back, back into observations again on the right, is the change in the winds in the southern hemisphere. Where it's red, the westerly winds are increasing. That's a trend that is attributable to, to climate change, warming. Why? Because it stays cold in the middle, but it's gotten warmer outside, um, and so the winds are stronger. You have a bigger temperature gradient driving that. Um, and at the same time, the surface temperature is warming all the way outside here, but on the inside, it's actually cooling because there's a lot more melting of ice and more fresh water around that can cool off because it's just sitting there floating. Um, and something we're also seeing um, with our ship-based measurements um, is that looking in this sector of the West Antarctic Peninsula, this is the uh, Ross Sea, Amundsen, Bellingshausen, we see over the decades that the warm water that's near the surface there is warmer and there's more of it. Um, that means the circulation is stronger. It's pushing in more warm water and that's the area where the ice shelves are endangered. And we also see changes in sea ice. Uh, we see a trend that I showed before. We also see trends in the sea ice season. Uh, some places it's longer, some places it's shorter. That's all attributable to the circulation changing. Um, and this year, there was a, a, an amazing phenomenon. I can show it back here. Actually, this cut back here in the Weddell Sea, uh, where it melted much faster. Um, uh, started out earlier in the season as a big hole in the ice. This is something that happens, it's, it's a special climate feature for this region of the sea ice. Um, it happened biggest in the 1970s, and it hadn't happened since. But all the models get it all the time, so you know the models are kind of not so great. <laughs> but the real world didn't get it again till last year, and this hole opens up really early in the winter. It's over topography, there's vigorous mixing, and there's also an inflow of warm water from the northeast. Um, so we're seeing something more vigorous going on in this region of the Southern Ocean that's kind of fun. We had some floats in it, the star marks the dot, and our graduate students are very busy working on a paper on that, uh, measurements in that, it's called a polynia. So to summarize, we've had strengthening westerly winds. Um, that's increasing the upwelling, it's increasing the circulation. That delivers more warm water. Um, there, we are melting ice shelves from both the bottom and the top. Uh, this should destabilize the ice sheets, and it, it is. Um, and you see sea ice changes that are due to changing circulation. And we're seeing, I didn't talk about the carbon cycle, but it's something we're very busy measuring with our new floats. Um, we see more outgassing, uh, we expect more outgassing in the outgassing regions, more uptake in the uptake regions, um, excess carbon at the top, and, in, and actual measurements in the field of uh, pteropods in distress. So I think that's it. Um, I said these all before. These are the ocean, uh, ocean take-home messages, and there we are. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Right. So I think we have time for maybe just two questions, and we're going to do the microphones again. Uh, so if folks have questions, please go by either this microphone or this microphone, and then, and then we'll do some questions. Nobody has no, a question. Okay, yes. Hi. I have a question about the nutrient cycling. Um, it sounds like it's mostly coming from the uh, southern ocean because that's where the upwelling is and then it's getting distributed. Um, I noticed that that seems like the farthest possible place from where the nutrients would be most useful, which I think would be the equatorial regions near land. Does it matter that it happens down there? It, are, like, are these distribution mechanisms really efficient or are we like, effectively using losing nutrients because they're um, produced so far from the biomass? Uh, um, well, it's large-scale circulation. So this, you know, the time scale of the upper ocean is, if you look globally, is about 50 to 100 years or so. Um, so the waters come up, and then they, um, they actually warm. They get pushed north. They warm up because the air is warm, and they stay up. And then they go in in the upper 1,000 meters. So they're filling sort of the top 1,000 meters of the ocean. Um, and they're just the, it's a slow supply. 
uh, and, the, and the deep water time scale coming back is several hundred years. So it's, this is the several hundred year scale. There's a very, very vigorous um, you know, local um, and regional um, ecosystem on top of it. But what we're saying here is that, this is a Jorge Sarmiento 2004, is that um, the overall global balance is this mainly driven by this upwelling of nutrients in the southern ocean and then use, use of them to the north. Does that answer the question? Well, do you lose any over that 100 years? Sure. Um, uh, uh, the North Pacific is, is uh, getting its own, it's doing its own internal thing. It's going to take 50 to 100 years to get in there. Do you lose them? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're used. Uh, they come, but they're only really used in the surface 100 meters. So it's a matter of the, how you get the vertical exchange up to the surface. In the tropic, it's, it's a direct upwelling. Um, so you're going to feed them in, and then they'll come up to the surface. So there's a, there you, have to, you have to model all of it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. let's take one more one question. More. And, yeah. yeah. Um, when the oceans are full of tides and waves and things, how do you actually measure 15 centimeters of rise? I, I believe you, but I just I can't understand how you can measure that. I left Small that thing. slide out. Okay. You do, um, and I have that slide. Um, you can go on the NOAA sea level tide gauge website, and they have this amazing website. Um, and you can find all the tide gauges, um, and then you click on them. Yay, NOAA. Um, and uh, they'll show you the whole record, and they'll show you the trend over the whole record. So yes, you see all of the, let's say, I think they're monthly averages. You'll see the whole tide gauge record, and you'll see that you need about 80, 50, 70, 80 years to get that trend. So if somebody turned their tide gauge off in 1955, it's no go. You don't know. Um, uh, but there are enough long-term tide gauges out there to verify that. OK. Let us thank our speaker, yeah. Lynn, again. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Sorry. Enjoy the rest of the <laughs> Yes. That was great. Yeah, yeah.